Ladies and gentlemen, I am Chang Wenxin with the Asan Institute for Policy Studies. Uh, let me welcome you all to this session on the topic dealing with nuclear North Korea, repeated topic over the sessions of yesterday and today. I think we will be particularly pleased that we have with us a group of eminent panelists who I'm sure will be able to offer acute insights into desirable solutions to nuclear armed North Korea at this critical juncture. To begin with, let me briefly introduce our distinguished members of this panel. Seated next to me, Professor Lee Jong-min. He is Professor of International Relations at the Graduate School of International Studies in Yonsei University. He serves as the Korean Ambassador for Na for national security affairs. Next to him, we have Dr. Michael O'Hanlon. He is a senior fellow with the Center for 21st Century Security and Intelligence and director of research for the foreign policy program at the Brookings Institution. Next to him, we have Dr. Bennett Remberg. He is an independent foreign policy consultant and writer. He is an expert on nuclear weapons proliferation, terrorism, and international politics. And finally, next to him, we have Professor Yamaguchi Noburu. He retired as Lieutenant General and is now Professor and Director of National Defense Academy of Japan. Before we get started, let me go over just one housekeeping rule for the panel discussion. Uh, each panelist will take five to seven minutes for, for his talk so that we will have ample time for Q&A session. Our first speaker will be uh, Professor Lee. Uh, Professor Lee, last year in the Wall Street Journal you wrote that uh, the price for normalization of diplomatic relations with the U.S. is the North Korean armies and the regime's uh, sacred nuclear weapons programs, arguing that Kim Jong-un's biggest, biggest obstacles to reform aren't Washington and Seoul, but his own party apparatus. In addition, in, 19, uh, in 2009, in an IFRI's proliferation paper titled as The Evolution of nuclear, uh, North Korean Nuclear Crisis, Implications for Iran, you wrote that the last two decades, we have witnessed, uh, the last two decades have witnessed the emergence of true proliferation network, pointing out North Korea as one of the members of the proliferation network five. And you used very interesting expressions such as nuclear symbiosis or uh, nuclear cousins. Within these context, uh, contexts, uh, could you provide us with your general assessment on nuclear threats from North Korea in order to lead our discussions? Please. Well, thank you very much. It's, it's a pleasure to be back on the panel. It's always scary when you, your moderator has actually read something you wrote. Um, and so you're wondering, my gosh, you know, did I say anything stupid uh, or write anything really uh, rambunctious? Uh, going back to the key points, let me just begin by, since all of us in this room have worked on the nuclear issue for the last tw two decades, let me begin by giving you my personal assessment of what I call the three great or the four or five great myths about the North Korean nuclear problem. And, and again, I'm speaking totally in my personal capacity. One of, the, one of the enduring myths before the North Koreans actually exploded their first nuclear device back in 2006 was that North Korea had no intention to develop nuclear weapons in the first place. And even if they did, they would give it up at the right price. And a, a third, I guess, myth was that even if the North Koreans have nuclear weapons, the real reason why they have them is because of the consistent and persistent U.S. pressure. So that North Korea's insecurity is the fundamental reason, the raison d'etre, why the North Koreans have nuclear weapons. And I, my personal view is that all those myths basically are, are incorrect because, as we have seen with the agreed framework and other agreements, well-intentioned, have basically all failed. And they've not failed because the Americans or the South Koreans have walked away from the agreements. It's because much 
of the responsibility for why those agreements failed was because of North Korea's inability to abide by those terms. Now, we have heard over and over again, I'm joined in this panel by my very good friend, uh, Noboru Yamaguchi. A couple of years ago, we, we met in Hawaii, and he actually told me a very interesting story. He said, you know, Changmin, we've had so many red lines that these red lines have become red carpets. And so, I know Noboru, I, I stole that because I wanted to take credit for that, although I, I am giving you credit for what you said. And over and over again, we've heard two other, I guess, assumptions. It is, number one, all options are on the table. Well, as I've always said, <clears throat> all options are not on the table on the Korean Peninsula simply because of the escalatory nature of using force. And the table is becoming smaller anyways. And so every single U.S. president since Bill Clinton on down have said all options are on the table. But as I said, all options are never on the table. So let's not kid ourselves. Secretary Gates and others have said over and over again, we will never buy the same horse twice. Well, I'm afraid we are about to buy the same horse, or the same pony at least, for the third or fourth time. And it's not because we're led by inexperienced policymakers in Washington and Seoul, it's because we really don't have all that much of a good option. What do I think are the major forces that will drive the North Korean nuclear issue in the foreseeable future? And number one, obviously, is the extent to which Kim Jong-un holds on to power. And this is the $64,000 question. Um, how long will he remain in power? How, does, how well does he control the KPA? I really don't know. Ask Katie, and he probably has a better assessment than I do. But I think his ability to control events in North Korea are not as strong as some people assume. And so I would argue that over the longer term, the next three, five years, his ability to control events perhaps will become weaker. The second major driver has nothing to do with North Korea. It is what I would call the pins. Uh, Pakistan, Iran, uh, North Korea, Syria, Afghanistan. These are all critical security issues that will impinge upon how the U.S. will be able to to focus its attention on the North Korean nuclear problem. If Syria goes belly up, if Afghanistan worsens after the uh, US withdrawal, if the situation in Pakistan becomes more unstable, if Iran crosses the nuclear thre uh, threshold, then we're entering into a very different dynamic. And in that sense, this is why I would argue that I wrote earlier a couple of years ago, several years ago, that <clears throat> we've got to watch what North Korea has learned from Iran and vice versa. The third major driver is China's strategic calculus. And here I think we are watching the Chinese very carefully because for the first time in memory, I believe that President Xi Jinping and the new leadership from China has to really recalibrate their North Korea policy. Not because they love the US or they love South Korea, it's because a nuclearized North Korea is their worst nightmare. And if Mr. Xi Jinping realizes this, I believe there will be a U-turn in very small degrees, but there will be a U-turn. And that U-turn, I believe, will be uh, a critical player. My final point, <clears throat> I think we're at a historical juncture, 20 years after the, the eruption of the nuclear crisis, we're at this really critical fork. And the fork has two uh, key issues. One is, if we don't address this issue from a very holistic perspective, in the next four or five years, the North Koreans could have 20, 30 plus nuclear warheads. And if they miniaturize a warhead on a ballistic missile with intercontinental capabilities, that is the worst nightmare for the US. And so we've got to really wake up to that issue and then convince the Chinese that if the Chinese don't come on board, there will be consequences. The second point people have mentioned about strengthening the US, Japan, Korea security cooperation, I wholeheartedly agree, despite the fact that we've had difficulty with the Japanese. And above and beyond the North Korean nuclear issue, I think it is time that the Americans and the South Koreans and the Japanese uh, get together and basically think about a roadmap that enables them to overcome uh, key political hurdles. This will take a lot of um, uh, hand-holding and lots of patient dialogue between Seoul and Tokyo and Washington. 
but I remain hopeful that over the course of the next year or so, despite ongoing issues, we will be able to preserve a very robust and forward-looking uh, U.S.-Korea-Japan relationship. I'll end there. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Lee. Uh, bearing in mind the meets provided by Professor Lee, now let us invite uh, Dr. O'Hanlon. Dr. O'Hanlon, in your recent book titled as Healing the Wounded Giant, Maintaining Military Preeminence While Cutting the Defense Budget, you dealt with nuclear weapons, missile defense, and intelligence in the chapter. Uh, could you be more elaborate on your analysis on how the U.S. will cope with no North Korean nuclear crisis while cutting the defense budget? In addition, in 2003, in the book titled as Crisis on the Korean Peninsula, co-authored with Mr. Mike Mochizuki, you suggested a solution in the form of grand bargain with North Korea, addressing not only the nuclear issue but also the convention of forces on the hyper-militarized peninsula. Do you still believe that such a grand bargain with North Korea will work for denuclearization of North Korea? You have the floor, Dr. Thank you, and it's very nice to be part of this discussion. Very hard questions. I think 10 years later, after Mike Mochizuki and I wrote about this idea of a grand bargain, we've now seen three North Korean nuclear tests. We've seen perhaps further progress towards developing uranium enrichment capability. We have continued complete lack of access or knowledge about the specifics of that. We have some worries about reactors being constructed again. And we've had things like the Chonan. So it hasn't been exactly a very good 10 years. Uh, but I've got to stay hopeful at some level, partly because there's no other choice. And by the way, I'm just glad today, metaphorically, we've come out of the depths of the underground amphitheater up to the above ground. Welcome to above ground Washington, uh, visiting friends from, from Korea. And so this makes me think of the sun, sunshine policy. And maybe we can't quite go to the sunshine policy immediately. Uh, but I think we have to hold out that hope. Yesterday, uh, my good friend Paul Wolfowitz and I had a little bit of a, uh, of a friendly debate from one panel to the next about whether there could ever be reform within a given family or dynasty. And that's a fascinating historical debate. But I'm not suggesting that Kim Jong-un has to be persuaded tomorrow to give up nuclear weapons or even sign on to a grand bargain that would have him do so eventually. I think we can be a little bit more incrementalist, still holding out the vision of a grand bargain, but accepting that we're not going to be able to negotiate it anytime soon. And we have some more practical, immediate issues, like cutting off North Korean fissile material production, as Gary Seymour discussed yesterday, making sure there are no more Chonan-like incidents, um, as General Sharp and others discussed yesterday. And, um, and I think we can use our combination of sanctions, trade and aid, and diplomatic and security relations to create a number of incentives and sort of a, a path, not necessarily an all-in-one bargain. I'll just say a couple more things. I'm not going to necessarily take all seven minutes, but people talk about how we've bought the same horse two or three times. I'm not defending anything about North Korean behavior, but I would challenge that uh, pithy s summary of uh, American, Korean, Japanese policy because we bought the horse once in 1994, and then when we realized the North Koreans were not complying, we essentially cut off the energy cooperation. We haven't really offered it again at the same scale. We have provided humanitarian aid, but that's partly to keep the North Korean people alive. Now, we know the regime tries to use some of that aid for its own purposes, but I'm not sure I would say that's buying the same horse a second or a third time. We know we would like to see the Chinese use their trade relationship with North Korea more assertively, and they've begun to this year after the third nuclear test. But again, that's sort of taking away the existing feeding uh, of the horse rather than buying it again. So in other words, we're talking about adding additional restrictions, not buying the same deal repeatedly. So again, the North Koreans are trying to sell us the same horse two or three or four times. But I think we've been fairly good at limiting the degree to which we provide them any such positive incentives. They're in a worse position now in terms of their dealings with the outside world than they were 10 years ago. The uh, sanctions have been tightened in most ways that I can see. And, and uh, I'm, not, I'm not disagreeing with that. I think you have to create some disincentives, even as you try to talk about a grand bargain. 
So the last point I would make, and it reiterates an argument I've been trying to introduce this year specifically, is that if we do see a need for additional sanctions, if Kim Jong-un lets his generals or whoever make some bad decisions again, like they did earlier this year, I would argue for additional sanctions that are temporary and naturally and automatically sunsetting. Because I think even as we send a message of firmness with one hand, we need to send a message of hopefulness and openness with the other. The only way I can see how to do that is to make sanctions meaningful, but also make any additional sanctions temporary. So you create an incentive for North Korea not to repeat the same bad behavior. I still think we have to hope that over time Kim Jong-un may turn out to be at least partially reformist. Not because he's a nice guy, not because he wants to lose power, but for exactly the opposite reason, that he comes to the realization that he won't be able to hold on to power for half a century, which is presumably his goal, unless he makes some changes. And so we've got to think about all of our policies with an eye towards making that kind of outcome possible, and it may take five or ten years. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. O'Hanlon. Uh, let us now move to one of narrower solutions for dealing with nu- uh, nuclear North Korea. Uh, Dr. Ramberg, uh, this may, uh, the argument made by you appeared on the magazine, uh, I mean the internet version of the magazine, Foreign Policy, under the thought-provoking title, Send the Nukes Back to South Korea, with subtitle, At the Stroke of Pan, President uh, Obama could reassure a key ally and put Pyongyang back in its box. Here's how. Do you still believe that the uh, reinstallation of nuclear weapons, more precisely speaking, tactical nuclear weapons, into South Korea may be the answer to the history of failed diplomacy with North Korea? If affirmative, could you be more elaborate on the justification for your argument? In addition, could you tell us another concrete measures, I mean options, if you have, that could be taken jointly within the context of Korea-U.S. alliance to achieve our common goal, the denuclearization of North Korea? Well, thank you for the introduction, and and I want to thank the host for inviting me to this presentation. That's one of three arguments I'm going to be talking about today. I come with a pessimistic point of view with regard to North Korea. Frankly, North Korea is not going to give up its nuclear weapons. No negotiation, no carrots, no sticks are going to allow North Korea to give up their nuclear weapons. In fact, let's look at history, which informs me uh, with regard to giving up nuclear weapons. We've only had two cases in history. Am I being heard here? Two cases in history where nuclear weapons have been given up by countries. One case was South Africa, which was mentioned in a question, uh, question yesterday. Why did it give it up? You had the end of the apartheid regime. Then you have the case of the former Soviet Union, where three republics had the bomb after the, uh, the country, uh, four republics actually, after the country uh, dissolved, and Russia kept its nuclear arsenal. The other three gave up either nuclear weapons material or weapons themselves. Belarus and Ukraine gave up weapons. They made the judgment under U.S. and Russian pressure to be sure to, uh, 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 they gave up th- their weapons, but one of the considerations for the giving up of the weapons was a, an evaluation. They felt they'd be less secure with nuclear weapons, less secure with nuclear weapons than with weapons. So for the North Korean point of view, that's not the case. What we find in North Korea is nuclear weapons provide a security, a vital security blanket. And let's not be so smug about this with regard to other countries around the world. For every country today that has nuclear weapons, nuclear weapons provides a security blanket, including the United States. We're not going to give up under the Obama plan, the most current uh, proposal, when we're going to go down to 1,000 nuclear weapons. For the North Koreans, this uh, nuclear program represents a, a great uh, national investment. Think about it. A very poor country has invested in this, in this arsenal, developed the nuclear weapons with limited resources. It secures the regime in splendid isolation and don't bank on regime collapse. We've been suggesting that we see regime collapse going back to the Clinton administration. So what are the options we have to deal with North Korea? I think we can look at the options through the lens of what I call arms control. And I know that typically when people think of arms control, they think of bean counting. You have country A and you have country B, and we're dropping down the arsenals of both countries. That's not the definition that I'm going to be using of arms control. It's anything that reduces the probability of war. This is a definition drawn from the Nobel Prize winner Thomas Shelley. Anything that reduces the probability of war. And so let me put forward some uh, unorthodox options. These are options to deal with North Korea. 
not convictions. One option, I'm just going to list the options at first and then elaborate them uh, within a, the limited time I have. One option would be to recognize North Korea as a nuclear armed state and offer, I'm, ta I'm talking from an American point of view, offer unconditional diplomatic relations. Another option, the entirely opposite of option number one, would, to li would be to leave North Korea alone, let North Korea stew on, in its own dysfunction, and let the Chinese government prop it up. Then there's option three, which uh, my uh, moderator mentioned, which would be to return uh, nuclear weapons to South Korea and possibly use this as leverage to denuclearize the peninsula, as we saw in Europe in the 1980s when we eliminated a class of nuclear weapons uh, in uh, Western Europe and in the Soviet Union. So let me go through these options. Re recognize North Korea as a nuclear armed state and offer North Korea, that is the United States, unconditional diplomatic relations. I know there's some people who are going to say, mine, oy vey, I mean, what is this guy talking about? But we've seen this before in history. Think about it. When Richard Nixon went to China, he didn't ask the Chinese to disarm. He didn't ask the Chinese to eliminate his nuclear weapon. And Chinese at that time, and for the preceding decade or two, was the bete noir of the United States, a far graver risk uh, than North Korea is today. Yet the Nixon administration did not make that demand of China. He asked for normalization relations, and those relations followed uh, uh, in, in time. So let's assume that we apply this policy to North Korea. What are the pluses, the benefits, and the harms of applying recognition of the North Korean state and unconditional uh, diplomatic relations? Uh, as far as harm, let me start with harms. It will legitimize a very bellicose nuclear state next to South Korea, and, uh, uh, which has posed threats to that country, nuclear threats, as well as threats to the United States. It would buttress the regime. The regime would be beating its chest saying, we beat you at this, if you recognize them as a nuclear armed state. It would certainly blow a hole through the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, suggesting to Iran and other countries, North Korea could beat the United States, and so will we. It would allow Pyongyang to gain diplomatic relations by allowing to Pyongyang to extort concessions from the United States if we, rep uh, if we recognize the North Korean regime. However, consider some of the benefits. It reflects reality. It reflects reality. North Korea is a nuclear arming state at the very least. It would provide, that is, diplomatic recognition, would provide a window, of, uh, a window into North Korea. We would have people on the ground in North Korea, something we don't have today. It would allow for communication in crisis. We don't have good communication in crisis. It would reduce North Korea's isolation. Uh, hopefully, diplomatic relations would open up other venues with regard to commerce and other things. Consider the alternative, a reclusive, isolated, paranoid a nuclear in North Korea with poor intelligence and uncertain command and control with, a, uh, with his finger on the trigger. Is this what we want or do we want to provide better communication, better interface with North Korea? That is option number one. Option number two, leave North Korea alone, let North Korea stew in its own dysfunction with Chinese support. You know, consider we've been involved in North Korea, as people have mentioned, for some 20 years. The North Koreans committed themselves to nuclear nonproliferation in 1985, in 1991, North and South Korea agreed to nuclear de uh, denuclearization of the peninsula. They violated that. In 1994, there was the agreed framework. That went down the tubes. We had the six-party talks that failed, the Sunshine Policy, the February 29, 2012 uh, uh, agreement with the United States to have a moratorium with regard to nuclear missile tests and uranium enrichment. That failed. So did sanctions failed, and carrots also failed. Food, food assistance, uh, oil assistance, and the... Um, industrial zone in South, uh, that South Korea provided. What about some of the other options that have been put forward among the military action? This was briefly talked about yesterday. Clearly a military strike against North Korean facilities, if we could find them, which I don't believe we could find all of them, would uh, likely induce a, a, a new Korean war. What about isolation of North Korea proposed by John Bolton? He suggested we totally isolated North Korea in a series of articles he authored for the Wall Street Journal. That's not possible without China's cooperation. How does this serve arms control, that is, leaving North Korea alone? It serves arms control by eliminating illusions and allowing us to keep our guard up. How about option number three, in which I call for the return of nukes to South Korea to enhance deterrence? The United States is really stretched today. We're broke. Well, we can't uh, meet uh, many of our uh, needs as we look to the future. Allowing nu nuclear weapons to return to uh, South Korea actually is the cheap way to enhance deterrence. It, uh, it broaches a policy that we followed from 1958 to 1991. The Eisenhower administration concluded we could get deterrence on the cheap 
with the presence of uh, nuclear weapons on the peninsula? What about the offshore capacity, which we demonstrated in recent military exercises, the flying in of bombers from Missouri and Guam? These are planes that fly in and fly out. Would they provide the enduring commitment that the South Koreans would feel comfortable with? I'm raising this as an open question. Uh, with nuclear weapons on the, on the, in South Korea, it would reduce South Korea's incentive to get the bomb and could be sold to the PRC on grounds that with the bomb, with our bomb in South Korea, South Korea would not be incentivized to nuclearize. It, reduce, it would reduce North Korea's gaming uh, of nukes to prevent blackmail and intimidation and would offer a bargaining ship, possible bargaining ship, similar to what we found in Europe in the 1980s. When the Reagan administration placed Pershing uh, missiles in Europe to combat the missiles that the Soviet Union placed in the western part of the country, intermediate missiles, resulting in the INF agreement. However, there are risks here for this particular proposal. It would increase tensions with, uh, with Pyongyang. It would nonetheless raise China's ire and would undermine the, uh, President Obama's non-proliferation policy. Of the three options that I put forward, I was always disposed to option number one. That is, recognizing North Korea as a nuclear-armed state and recognizing the regime diplomatically. But the more I thought of it, given the way North Korea's game things, I've concluded that North Korea would extort diplomatic relations. My conclusion draws from the, from the probability that North Korea would say, once diplomatic relations would be established, look, to continue these relations, well, we, North Korea, are demanding that the United States remove troops from South Korea. Then the Western Pacific, there would be a gaming process. So I'm most disposed, as I think about these three options, to option number two, leave North Korea alone, let North Korea stew in its own dysfunction with uh, Chinese sustenance to the North Korean regime if it wants. With one qualification, now the North Koreans have been demanding or calling for a resumption of negotiations, I would tell the North Koreans this. Uh, if you allow international inspectors back into North Korea with the authority the inspectors had in Iran from 1991 to 1994 to visit all suspect nuclear sites and disable all suspect nuclear weapons, and weapons materials and weapons functions will be able to talk to you at that point in time. Aside from that, uh, there's nothing to talk about. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Ramberg. Uh, we now have yes, Professor Yamaguchi. Uh, Professor Yamaguchi, the day before yesterday, uh, when we met at the Narita Airport in Tokyo, <laughs> uh, you told me a cynical, the same cynical joke with regard to red lines as you did to Professor Lee. In addition to the joke, uh, we have exchanged our concerns over recent conflicts with your neighbor countries over the interpretation of history because Korea, Japan, and China share various areas of cooperation for non-proliferation as well as counter-proliferation. With this regard, could you tell us some prospective role of Japan in the efforts to accomplish non-proliferation as well as counter-proliferation of nuclear weapons, related materials and technology from North Korea, even under these hard time circumstances created by recent conflicts over historical issues, as evidenced by the failure of the conclusion of GISOMIA, General Security of Military Information Agreement. Please. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much. Uh, I, I, I'd like to thank to, to Asan Institute uh, for uh, inviting me uh, to this really uh, important event. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Han. And uh, I thank you very much uh, for uh, Lee Jong Min uh, to, uh, to mention, uh, for mentioning uh, the story I gave. But I have to confess that uh, two things. Uh, um, one point I, I have to confess is that uh, I, I, I owe a lot to, to Lee Jong Min. Maybe uh, he, 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 he quoted my, uh, my one story, but I have quote, quoted his maybe 10 or 15 stories. Uh, so I, I, I owe a lot about the joke, a number of jokes. And the second point I need to, uh, to confess is uh, I'm, an, I'm an optimist by training. I used to fly helicopter, which my aerodynamic uh, professor uh, used to say they cannot fly. And they are flying because they are wrong. <laughs> so I'm, I, I'm kind of optimi optimist, and um, I, um, I was assigned to, when I was assigned to this panel, I thought I don't like it, because I don't like a nuclear, uh, nuclear North Korea. I don't like it. That is, uh, that is the, the, the most important point I, I, I need to tell you. 
Uh, that means uh, denuclearization uh, should never, uh, uh, should never uh, be uh, forgot. Uh, we should never forget about the ultimate goal of denuclearization of uh, Korean Peninsula. That is, uh, that is uh, the bottom line. Having said that, uh, um, the uh, nuclear weapons uh, of North Korea uh, pose um, a set of uh, different aspects of uh, dangers, serious aspects. For instance, we need, uh, at least we need to, to go through at least three, three aspects. The uh, first one is the fiscal uh, you know, destruction, um, maybe caused by the de uh, detonation of uh, um, explosion of uh, nuclear weapons, uh, or the, not nuclear weapons, but related uh, uh, technology, or the missile, uh, missiles, long-range missiles. So uh, uh, what, uh, that is one, uh, but I, 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 what... The uh, reason why I'm uh, talking about this is, uh, you know, the, from one the aspect to another, uh, the U.S., Japan, Korea, China, uh, Russia, and other countries may have uh, different views, uh, different sensitivities uh, uh, on those uh, aspects of dangers. Uh, first one is, uh, you know, a fiscal uh, um, threat to, uh, to the neighbors. Uh, so. Um, um, the uh, neighboring countries, uh, the, which is in, in the range of uh, uh, North Korea's uh, long-range missiles or range of uh, bombers or something um, the, which can deliver uh, nuclear weapons, uh, um, very much con those nations are very much concerned about that, uh, that kind of threat. And second uh, danger is uh, to against the uh, um, international efforts uh, for non-proliferation and counter-proliferation. Uh, through, uh, you know, um, the, having a nuclear North Korea, uh, we, will, uh, we will see a deteriorated uh, non-proliferation treaty regime, uh, in a sense. It's, it's a, I think, uh, the uh, problem of psychology uh, of the people. And also, you know, um, the uh, North Korea's nuclear programs may, uh, may pose the, the physical um, the, uh, danger uh, by transferring uh, their uh, uh, nuclear weapons or nuclear-related technology. Uh, it is against our efforts uh, for non, non and counter proliferation. That is really uh, serious. And thirdly, as, uh, 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 as my colleagues uh, have mentioned, uh, North Korea is uh, isolated uh, because of uh, sanctions and uh, because of their uh, bad behavior. Uh, that iso isolation may cause uh, further pro provocation or uh, no, um, the further provocation or um, the, the difficulties in economy and politics uh, inside North Korea that may pose that may cause the really serious unrest uh, that may sp uh, have a spillover uh, to, to neighboring countries or even um, you know, like uh, 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 like an uh, uh, event uh, which may uh, require military involvement of China or the U.S. or uh, South Korea. So those three, uh, at least three kinds of uh, um, dangers are existing, and uh, you know, um, any, kind, any, uh, any of uh, them can happen today or tomorrow. And then uh, the sensitivity among us may differ uh, from, um, from U.S., Japan uh, to Korea or China. And uh, those differences uh, should be uh, discussed uh, at, at the beginning. And uh, otherwise, uh, we, we cannot uh, set the priority uh, in, in a correct way. So that is a starting point uh, uh, for, for the discussion um, on, on this, uh, this, uh, this topic. Okay, thank you very much. Well, uh, now we shall turn to the audience for comments and questions. Uh, if you have comments or questions, please raise your hands and identify yourself. And I'll try to, well, take the questions in order. Okay. Uh, Mike Masetic, following up on the question from the first panel, Ambassador Hill gave a very strong statement about why the rest of the world cannot accept North Korea becoming a nuclear power, even though they have nuclear weapons. But then uh, Ambassador Han said that the rest of the world does accept India and Pakistan as nuclear powers. I don't know whether this is a definitional issue, because given Pakistan's record on 
non-proliferation, supporting terrorism, a military that has no civilian control, why one is more acceptable than the other, and doesn't this selective definition of what we accept and don't accept undermine the entire principle of non-proliferation, especially when we try and apply it to North Korea? Okay. I want to take two more questions. Okay. Uh, I'm Larry Nix from uh, CSIS. I want to ask about the counter-proliferation policy, which was announced in March and stems back to the decision in December 2010 to develop a policy of retaliating militarily against North Korean provocations similar to what happened in November 2010 with the shelling of uh, Yangpyeong Island. This policy was announced again in March. We now have the scenario, and there was a number of reports that came out in late March and April that North Korea, as we speak today, is probably mounting nuclear warheads on its Nodong missiles, which of course would reach all of South Korea and most of Japan. So my question is, what kind of challenge or challenges to the planning for the counter provocation policy and, if necessary, the implementation of this, implementation of this policy, would a North Korean actual warheading capability pose to the ROK in the U.S. in planning for and, if necessary, implementing the counter provocation policy? Okay, one more question? No, okay. Who will take the questions first? Okay, I'll hand on, Doctor. Sure. Uh, two great questions. I won't, well, I'll say a brief word about each. Uh, North Korea versus Pakistan, very interesting case study. Uh, I, would, I would acknowledge and agree with your point, sir, that there is um, a lack of a completely clear case as to why one is largely accepted by the international community in the sense we still do normal trade with Pakistan and so forth. Uh, the other is not. I would argue that Pakistan is one more Mumbai away from becoming in North Korea's category. And I hope Pakistani friends recognize that. And I'm relieved that at least it's been five years since the last Mumbai. And I hope there'll never be another one. In other words, North Korea is, uh, as a matter of state policy, uh, essentially extraordinarily oppressive towards its own people and still belligerent uh, towards its southern neighbor in the sense of, frankly, not recognizing the existence of that neighbor. You could argue as to how much worse that is than the way Pakistan behaves towards India, but at least Pakistan has a, a certain amount of thriving internal political life and space, and the regime doesn't consistently make war with its own people. Uh, it has a lot of flaws, but... I would say that for the moment there is a meaningful distinction, in, in fact quite a distinction between the two, and that's why North Korea is treated the way it is. And that means that North Korea has a, a route before it to get relief from this sort of treatment, which is to act better towards the international community and its own people. And it doesn't have to solve every problem at once. I may or may not uh, fully go along with the notion that North Korea is going to keep nuclear weapons forever. Uh, but I don't think we have to necessarily settle that matter for now because they certainly are going to keep them for a long time. If we can just see them start, start to limit their arsenal, improve their behavior, scale back a little bit their military, lighten up a little bit on their human rights oppression towards their own people, see incremental steps, we can begin to see the world engage with them more fully and they can move closer to a Pakistan category in terms of how they're treated. That would be one very brief point. On the, on the issue of nuclear weapons being mated to... Um, ballistic missile uh, capabilities that Larry raised. I would just very, there's a lot to discuss, of course. It's a big question. I'm glad you put it on the table because it certainly belongs in a panel dealing with a nuclear North Korea. Uh, I, I do think we have to uh, probably militarily think through the scenario where nuclear weapons are used against our troops or our air bases or our ports. And we probably need to find some very calm and matter-of-fact ways to explain to North Korea uh, 
that that's not a war-winning capability. We can work around that militarily. We cannot necessarily protect all the citizens of Seoul from the consequences of a nuclear attack. We will try, but we may fail. However, North Korea should have no illusions that if it tries any kind of nuclear weapons employment, it will not change. In fact, it will guarantee the very outcome that it presumably would like to prevent, which is the overthrow of the regime. And we may need to, uh, in ways that we got used to doing in the Cold War, explain the details, some of the military details of why we have redundant access to a number of air facilities, redundant access to a number of ports, way that, ways that we can repair ports, even if they've been hit by a nuclear weapon, uh, other kinds of arguments that will explain to the North Koreans there's nothing to gain from the usage of nuclear weapons. And I hope the North Koreans are not really thinking seriously about using them, but we might as well make sure. And Dr. Randberg? Yeah, I, uh, with regard to Pakistan, we, we bent our non-proliferation policy towards Pakistan because it occurred at a time when the United States was supporting the Mujahideen uh, uh, against the Russians. And so we had conflicting interests. We tried to apply sanctions to Pakistan, but then again we, lift, uh, we, we decided to lift the sanctions, as we did more recently against India. Uh, we couldn't beat it, so we decided to use other policies to try to corral it, so to speak. So uh, that's with regard to India. Uh, but both are nuclear armed states, of course. Um, but as I suggested with regard to North Korea, I think we have to broaden our horizons as we're trying to deal with this. The, ma the, the, the concern I have about North Korea is managing a country with a nuclear weapon. And North Korea po uh, poses unique challenges. And I, I presented several options. I think they're out of the box. And I think we have to think uh, you know, out of the box when we're dealing this, with this particular country. Do you have a question? I, I think, Michael, you mentioned that Kim Jong-un could still undertake reforms if given you know, an opportunity. And my personal view is that we've heard this argument the last 20 years, even when Kim Jong-un was alive. And I think North Korea's ability to undertake reforms, economic reforms, is very, very difficult because of the political costs of reforms. Am I being heard? Uh, this microphone. Mm. In other words, it's not working. Is it on? Okay. Um, my main argument was that North Korea's ability to undertake economic reforms has nothing to do with whether the Americans or the South Koreans or the Japanese uh, uh, give them assistance or whatever. It's the domestic political cost of undertaking reforms that has prevented Kim Jong Il or Kim Jong Un from taking the leap and emulating Vietnam or China. And I have yet to be convinced uh, by political scientists or economists because if Kim Jong-un really wanted reforms, he would have done it. Um, I, I, what's holding him back? Um, I, I have no idea. He's spending more time building a ski resort, uh, but the first thing he has to do is to basically demolish his own gulags. Uh, on, the, on the nuclear issue, of course, the NPT by definition is uh, unfair. But I would argue that if the world gives North Korea de facto recognition, it would trigger a chain of events that would almost be uh, certainly negative on the part of South Koreans and Japanese. Um, on Larry's question on whether what we would do if the North Koreans get ICBMs with nuclear warheads, well, obviously, there will be greater emphasis on theater missile defense, uh, much more robust uh, Japanese and South Korean defense responses. Uh, maybe a military doctrine review, but I think at that point, both our Japanese friends and the South Koreans would have to say, okay, do we want to have our own nuclear deterrent? And my answer is no. Uh, even at that particular point, I would argue that we would still need a very robust U.S. Uh, nuclear umbrella. Could I just say Professor Young, uh, uh, oh, wait. Yes, two Sorry. fingers. Okay, just quick. Um, um, I have a problem with uh, uh, wa warding uh, North Korea with nuclear weapon forever. I, 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 I don't like to predict the future, but uh, one thing I can predict is uh, Korea will be unified before forever. <laughs> uh, Dr. Ryan? I, yeah, I just wanted, uh, you know, I agree that the overall body of evidence suggests that the prospects for reform in North Korea are mediocre at best. So I think that you need to also look at the second order benefits of laying out a strategy that allows for the possibility of reform without, without expecting it. One benefit is it keeps us unified with dealing with China, 
because China does not go along with a pure hardline approach from Washington and Seoul and Tokyo. It doesn't. And so if we have nothing but a hardline answer to the question of how to deal with North Korea, then we're going to have risks of losing whatever Chinese cooperation we're now beginning to get. A second benefit is that even if we don't ever persuade Kim Jong-un to give up all of his nuclear weapons, we would at least like to see him stop making more. And I think there's a real difference between 1 and 10 and 100 in terms of proliferation risks, among other things. And so trying to induce him to even undertake minimal economic reforms as part of a package deal that lets him, for a certain period of time, hold on to whatever arsenal he's got. It doesn't mean you have to formally recognize it, but as a, pa as a practical matter, you can agree you're not going to try to negotiate it away for a certain number of years, and you're going to try to stop the fissile material production. And then the amount of aid that you provide will be limited because if he's not giving up all of his nuclear weapons and that's still your goal, you can't reward him with a lot of aid. But you can lift some sanctions, you can provide limited targeted economic help, and that outcome is much better than a North Korea that's building 10 or 20 nuclear weapons per year. So I'm thinking also about second best and third best outcomes, not just the goal of hopefully uh, seeing Kim Jong-un reform his country. Right, but at, what, but at what point do you have, what assurance do you have, Michael, that th even this sort of new freeze number one, will be accepted by Kim Jong-un. And at some point down the road, you'd have to say, well, CBID is our ultimate goal, isn't it? Well, on the second one, I think there's a lot of room for finessing. And I just think, speaking of out of the box, it wasn't one of your options necessarily, but I agree with the general point. We don't necessarily have to make this a theolog theological matter of yes or no, uh, nuclear power or not. There's actually some shades of gray. And, and if we can stop the growth of that arsenal, we can live with a lot of uncertainty on the prospects for complete denuclearization down the road. So to me, that's the, the core issue. But I, I very much accept your point on the first matter, which is that we're going to need to have some access to see centrifuges dismantled. And it doesn't have to be the United States. It has to perhaps to be the Chinese or the Russians or the IAEA. But we're going to need to have that before we actually provide any kind of energy help, for example. There has to be some sense of verification that we're not seeing increased production. And, and, and you'll point out, and you'll be right, that what about the sites they don't declare? Um, so we're never going to be 100% sure that we've seen everything. But I would, I would reward uh, partial dismantlement with limited sanctions relief, and maybe even a little bit of aid. Okay, all right. Yes, for the second round, I'll take two, two more questions. Yes, Chris Nelson. Um, thanks so much, uh, Chris Nelson, Nelson Report. Another really great discussion. Um, uh, I, have, I have a question uh, mainly for my fellow Gettysburg veteran, General Yamaguchi, uh, which I'll, I'll get to in a minute. But this discussion reminds me of something that we haven't really gotten into that was gotten into at another excellent uh, conference recently at the Wilson Center where uh, Ambassador Davies uh, appeared with, uh, with Rudy Frank and Andre Lankoff's name was taken uh, many times in the conversation. And uh, so my comment, which you may want to uh, comment on, is uh, both Rudy and, and uh, Andre think they're seeing the beginning of the possibility of a classic revolution of rising expectations through the creation of a non-elite middle class in Pyongyang. In other words, not just crony, the cronies and, uh, and, the, and the inner circle, but there's a hell of a lot of people now who have a piece of the action in what we would define as middle class. History shows us there are certain things that happen when that takes place. Uh, so uh, maybe we need to think about that when we're saying reform is impossible because of the control uh, regime. Uh, that's an interesting thing because neither Andre or Rudy are, are naive about this stuff having watched it happen. Uh, my question for, for General Yamaguchi, uh, we've also not discussed uh, something that recently happened that could have changed Japan's role, and that is the, the I Ijima mission to Pyongyang, which may or may not have been really done with Abe-san's permission, but certainly was designed to explore the possibility of, at last, putting the abductee tragedy behind Japan-Korea. Uh, my question is, uh, uh, if that had somehow succeeded, would that really change the equation for Japan's participation in the broader uh, uh, process? Uh, uh, and in the same sense, if, if abductees is still there, does that inevitably stop Japan 
full participation in these things because it simply is not going to be able to, for example, pony up money uh, to the North Koreans for whatever little deal we may we may be able to get out of them. Thank you. Okay. I'll move. Yes. Please. Hi, my name is Ethan So I'm a student at Georgetown University. Thank you uh, so much for all the panelists for coming here. I have, I have a question for Dr. Amber. Um, I have been intrigued by um, your second option about how uh, we can ignore North Korea and let it steal in its own dis dysfunction and have China deal with it. Uh, I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit further on how, whether we actually ignore it, uh, given, it given how North Korea engages in provocations to inc increase its bargaining power and how China will um, find incentives to rein in on uh, the North Korean regime uh, when we're ignoring the regime. Thank you. Okay, Professor Yamaguchi and then Dr. Ramberg. Yeah, thank you for your question, Chris. I, I think uh, the abductee issue uh, remains uh, very important among Japanese. Um, but in comparison with 10 years ago, um, Japanese uh, tend to look at the uh, nuclear missile, um, missile, uh, missiles of uh, North Korea more seriously. So um, abductee issue might have been um, the issue, but now um, I think Japanese tend to, tend to think, think that uh, the North Korean issue as a whole. So uh, one of the issue, uh, issues is uh, obviously abductee issue, but uh, that, uh, that, that should not um, really preoccupy um, everything uh, in Tokyo, uh, hopefully. Okay, and then Dr. Weinberg? Yes, yeah, so with regard to uh, during North Korea, um, my view, in time of crisis, we'd have to use China as the interlocutor. Uh, they would have to be the inter uh, intervener uh, between the United States, South Korea, and, uh, and the North. They, they're the ones that, had, that really have the, the potential influence, and they see that a crisis is escalating. It's not in their interest that the crisis get out of control. Obviously, if there was an incident, uh, South Korea is committed to respond, and respond in a very effective way. Uh, but uh, absent that, as the crises tend to mount, and we can see them mounting, I would suggest that I mean, there's, there's, there's nothing to talk to North Korea about. We've, we've spent 20 years' worth of talking. You could go to my option number one, which is a more robust way to deal with the country, uh, recognize them so we'd have direct communications with them. Again, I was very, very attracted to that. I've written several articles bearing on that particular option, but uh, my concern, as I indicated with regard to that, is the North will game it. And um, so uh, I'm left with option number two. Option number three, if I just might mention, uh, is, is plausible. Uh, you could put nuclear weapons back into South Korea. It would reduce their incentive to acquire nuclear weapons. As was indicated in the prior panel, about 60 plus percent of the South Korean population uh, seems to be inclined uh, towards having nuclear weapons either developed by the, by the country or, by, uh, or present by the United States. How reliable these polls are in the long term, I, I don't know. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, you know, these are options I, I think are worth considering, all of them. But uh, again, t uh, d with regard to your question, I think China could act as the interlocutor to try to douse the, the, uh, the crisis. Uh, it's just for my curiosity, well, Professor Lee, is there any prospects, I mean, possibilities of trilateral cooperation between China, Japan, and Korea with regard to the nuclearization of North Korea? Well, that's a very good question. <clears throat> Excuse me. And that depends on the level of political comfort that exists between Beijing, Tokyo, and Seoul. And the precondition for that, of course, is that the political tensions between China and Japan have to be overcome, and the political tensions between Japan and South Korea have to be overcome. At some point in time, within, I would say, the first five years of President Xi Jinping's term, he will have to realize that a nuclearized North Korea or a North Korea with 30-plus nuclear warheads or whatever they may have is going to be a huge negative for China's own strategic interests. And that could be a major incentive for them to change their views. I think there was one other question from the floor. Okay, yes. Jennifer, yes. Well, thank you very much for a great panel. I, I was just wondering um, uh, on the difference between North Korea treatment and India and Pakistan. I, nobody mentioned, I think, the NPT withdrawal by North Korea had a lot to do with that as well. And uh, a lot of, uh, some countries don't recognize that they really have withdrawn. It's triggered a huge debate about how to Im improve the withdrawal clause and so forth. But I would also like to ask Michael how he thinks that he could, you could prevent 
North Korea from developing more nuclear weapons? Developing more. more. Because you seem to think that would be one way, and I agree, but how do you keep them from making more? Well, I guess there's, Jennifer, thanks for the question. There are uh, obviously technical verification matters about which you've written very eloquently. There are also broader strategic matters about how do you structure a deal such that it's appealing enough for them to be willing. And I know we've got a variety of views on this panel about, on, on the latter subject, whether they ever would. On the former issue, I think, as we discussed yesterday a little bit with Gary Seymour and David Sanger, you'd have to have some degree of uh, additional protocol like privileges for the IAEA to go to more places than just declared sites in North Korea. They may not be able to find them, even if they have that right. But that's got to be any, if you're really meaningfully talking about denuclearization. Having said that, that's part of why I actually agree that in the short term, the North Koreans are not going to denuclearize. And it's, it's almost too big of an ambition in the short term. Uh, I think the North Koreans need to know that they want the full range of help uh, with their economy and otherwise that I hope someday they will recognize they need, but they haven't yet gotten there. They're going to have to virtually denuclearize. We, we can worry about the last one or two or three warheads and keep a little bit of murkiness on that, but they're going to have to give up some of what they've got. But I would be very content in the short term with a ceiling on their fissile materials, and I'd be prepared to think about some sanctions relief and, again, maybe even some targeted aid to try to get to that goal. And I'd like them all to know at the same time that if they misbehave further, that the Chinese may even think about restricting some of the existing trade. So I, I think it's got to be carrot and stick, which is part of why you've got to have a story that's appealing enough and that has enough of a positive side to get Beijing interested in being part of this process. Because if we don't have Beijing with us, everything else becomes much harder. I know that's just an incomplete answer to your question. But. Okay. I have um, you know, uh, two, po two comments on the, on, um, the discussion. Um, regardless uh, which scenario um, we go or we follow up, regardless which option uh, we take, the um, important thing is you know, um, South Korea is not going nuclear. Japan's not going nuclear. Uh, really important. Uh, in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, the, uh, preventing further proliferation of nuclear weapons, that should be regarded, uh, you know, uh, should be uh, thought. And also, uh, in order to, to keep that condition, uh, U.S. extended, uh, extended data is really important uh, to, 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 see, uh, to, to achieve the ultimate goal of denuclearization de of, of, of the Korean Peninsula. And, and also, Jap Japanese have, have, uh, have to work really, really hard uh, to, to, to restore the relations uh, with Koreans and Chinese. Uh -huh. Thank you. And more questions and comments from the audience? Okay, yes. Uh, my name is Mike Mazurov. I'm a foreign, uh, former foreign service officer. I was a Korea watcher in Beijing from 1989 to 1991-92. And at that point, uh, Jim Lilly, who was our ambassador and previously ambassador in Seoul, spent an enormous amount of time probing to find how close the lips and teeth relationship between the North Koreans and the Chinese really was. Mm -hmm. uh, he, there was a PLA general who was an ethnic Korean, Zhao Nan Chi, who proved to have a very negative view of North Korea. It, uh, a number of the North Korea watchers, uh, all Chinese and experts, people who had graduated from Kim Il-sung University, uh, the uh, Ning Fu Kui is a, a good example, who later became ambassador in Seoul, had pretty negative attitudes expressed privately about the, uh, uh, the North Koreans. And so I'd like to ask you, particularly uh, Mr. Ramberg, if you want China to be an interlocutor, do you think there are people there? Do you think truly, truly there is a, a warmer and closer relationship in some way between the Chinese and the North Koreans than the North Koreans have with any other mm -hmm. country? Because I think on the ground, at the granular level, the evidence is that there's, that's not there. The Chinese, in a sense, have chosen your option number one. Uh, tacit recognition of North Korea as a nuclear state, full diplomatic uh, relations, a certain degree of economic exchange, in hopes that eventually, over time, things will get better. Uh, but aside from that, uh, my personal view is that the, the North Koreans and the Chinese do not have a special relationship. As a matter of fact, 
All the irritations expressed about North Koreans that everybody has are shared by the Chinese. And I'd like reactions of the panel to that, that okay. observation. And the final floor to Kathy. Uh, the, I try not to raise any questions, but just maybe comment to Michael, that, uh, who is my dear colleague at Brookings. At, uh, I'm KDO from Institute for Defense Analysis, also a non-resident senior fellow at Brookings. One thing I would like to indicate the uh, very sheer fact and reality on North Korea, that is, this is the third generation family dictatorship. And I think Kim Jong-un may be personally very much interested in some changes in bringing new life, new blood, new spirit, and introducing some capitalistic benefit uh, for the Pyongyang citizen and North Koreans. For example, he was on the playground. He introduced his beloved wife, which I announced at the first day when BBC asked me, that's not his mistress, that's not his sister, that's his wife. Big change. And so the, he's maybe interested in, but um, unless he kills his grandfather and his father, this too damn foundation of the North Korean problem, he cannot, he cannot do any reform because he has to bury them what they built, what they created, the facade and all this lie republic. Every little myth has to be demystified. And he's the grandson anointed because of that biological DNA. So I think that is the North Korea's, the focal most important foundation that we have to remember. And that is a big difference from any country, Arab Springs, Pakistan, and Afghanistan. I do respect the, some you know, hopeful space, but I think this is a sheer reality on North Korea. He cannot do, he cannot, unless he kills his father and grandfather. Thank you. All right, Dr. Remberg, and then. Well, with regard to China, uh, the question is, is what country then can convey the message trying to soften a political crisis when it emerges? Uh, is it uh, the United States? Is it Russia? Is it any other country other than the Chinese? Which has the best opportunity to do so? And, uh, you know, you, you come from personal experience uh, dealing with this issue. You indicated there was contempt by the Chinese that you, inter that you interfaced with. It. But uh, if you would adopt option number two, as I suggested, it's the, the best option to communicate, I believe, or the best uh, vehicle or country to communicate messages to the North. The United States doesn't, we, we can meet at the United Nations, for example, with North, North, North representatives. But uh, if you have a country that has some clout uh, versus no clout, I think that would be the best option uh, if you adopt option number two. Option, there's obviously option number one. But again, I, I've, I've turned against it because I think they would really game, game that option, unfortunately. Okay, Dr. KDO, thanks for making that point. And again, it's similar to what uh, Paul Wolfowitz said yesterday. You're both very persuasive, and you're both probably right. <laughs> I acknowledge that. However, let me try a different narrative. I think one of the panels yesterday, the moderator suggested that people pretend they were briefing a foreign leader. Let me pretend I'm briefing Kim Jong-un and explaining why he can someday denuclearize without uh, trivializing or undercutting the legacy of his father and grandfather. He can say the historical period in which my father and grandfather uh, served and led this nation, these were dangerous periods for our country. They, they were the formative periods for our country. They were the Cold War periods. The hostile Americans had all these nuclear weapons at our doorstep, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and then there was this period of belligerence. And of course, if you were a North Korean, you would blame others for it. But then you could point to a period in which you had envisioned a different way for North Korea to get its future security, which was consistent with the legacy of what your father and grandfather had previously done. This is the way politicians think. I mean, this is, I, I grant you, it's a little bit harder in a dynasty, in a Stalinist communist dynasty. Um, but politicians uh, tend to be able to construct narratives that can explain where they've been and where they are, and that sometimes allow for a course change. So again, I'm not not disagreeing with you. You know North Korea very well, and um, your point is very well taken. It's going to be hard to have this day ever arrive. But I wouldn't rule it out that for the next 50 years, Kim Jong-un has to govern just the same way North Korea has all, always been governed, just because he is the son uh, of, of Kim Jong-il and the grandson of Kim Il-sung. I think strategically okay, we are minutes. just one minute before, so the opera doesn't end until the fat lady sings. So I think I have the last uh -huh. word. Well, and might, we can he, have he a meal because of, uh, maybe <laughs> Jung Min Lee has a things because of uh, 
I should be sitting actually at the podium to fight against all these different opinions. But anyway, <laughs> uh, the thing is that uh, Kim Jong-un, I am very thankful to that young man. You know, a little bit fat, but nonetheless, that's a different style. But uh, I like him a lot because he really made one seminar statement. You said the 50 years we, we may, they may give up resolution of nuclear, but he said these nuclear weapons are the, our platinum card, our strategic weapons, our survival weapons, my way to control 25 million North Koreans. This is not for the negotiation. He said clearly, and I liked it very much, because he made a one strong statement that was never spoken by Kim Jong-un, Kim Jong-il, his father. Thank you. Okay, final comments from Professor Lee and Professor yang -Duchi. Yeah, I'll, I'll take 30 seconds on mm -hmm. the Chinese question. I believe that the Chinese now are saying publicly that the first principle is denuclearization of the peninsula, followed by stability and security in the peninsula, and number three, negotiations. That may not seem all that much, difference from before, but it is a, a, a move, I think, to, to the right direction. I agree with you wholeheartedly that the military to military and the party to party relationship between China and North Korea, I would argue, have weakened over time. And so that bond that we saw during the height of the Mao or even Dong era and, 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 and between uh, Kim Il-sung, I just don't think exists today uh, with Kim Jong-un. And, and to all of our American friends who, who have studied this issue, uh, to death for the last 20 plus years. My final comment is this, and regardless of whether the North Korean nuclear issue ultimately gets resolved, is let us see what North Korea is as a state. And any country that basically has the most egregious human rights record on the planet, uh, name me one country that has gulags today where there are over 300,000 political prisoners. Name me one country that, a, that, that race basically starves its own people for political purposes. And name me one country that spends more money on defense and nuclear and WMD programs than, than feeding its own people. So, you know, I, we can have differences over approaches. But I would argue that if Americans are so gung-ho about human rights and about civil, uh, civil society and human rights and freedom and so forth, why don't you speak out more on, on North Korea's uh, egregious violation of human rights? And the same thing goes for South Koreans. And, and that has nothing to do with nuclear weapons. We'll talk about this over, over the next session, but that is perhaps a bigger, bigger issue uh, than North Korea with nuclear weapons. And Professor Yunguchi? Yunguchi? No, no. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, let us, well, thank all the panelists with warmest applause.